All right, we're happening. Chapter 18, Ruben and Babby's uh, Research Methods for Social Work. Chapter 18, Qualitative Research Specific Methods. This is podcast number two of three for session eight. <clears throat> Up to this point, we've been talking about what we do in qualitative research and other types of research. Chapter 18, we start moving to the how we do it phase of qualitative research, and specifically the interviewing and other data collection aspects of qualitative research. Today we're going to um, <clears throat> talk about a lot of things, I guess. As you can see, there are a lot. There is a lot more to conducting a qualitative project than just simply conducting a few interviews, taking a few notes, and writing up the report. Chapter 18, we'll spend some time learning about various preparations important in a successful qualitative project. Various roles that the observer can play in the qualitative research are discussed and the importance of thinking about and critically examine the relationship between us, the researcher, and what we have towards both our population under study and of the research topic. Although some specific methods of interviewing conducting focus groups. Also, also, we're going to talk about some specific methods of interviewing, conducting focus groups, taking life histories, along with some discussion about other methods for approaching qualitative research, and then some technical considerations about recording observations will also be discussed. Oh, there we see that again, preparing for the field. <clears throat> As many of you have experienced, well, I guess all of you have experienced if you've turned in your literature review and your literature critique assignments, is getting ready to do any kind of research takes some background review. It is important that we search the relevant literature prior to designing our research projects for several reasons. First, <clears throat> it is a general research tenet that we do not cover ground that is already settled science. Furthermore, if you're like me, when you go out and conduct a qualitative interview, particularly one that is in going to involve a lot of interactive process, i.e. probes and follow-up questions, you don't want to look like an idiot. At least I don't. So it's nice to be to have reviewed the relevant literature and to be in a position to question your participants. Also, question them about the relevance of the, that the literature has for their lived experience. For many types of qualitative research, particularly when it comes to disadvantaged or oppressed minority groups, finding and getting the collaboration of a key informant in your community or sub-community of study can be invaluable. If you have access to someone who has previously studied the same population you're interested in, or perhaps someone who has worked professionally with that population, then include them in your research protocol. The point at which one establishes initial contact with members of the group to be studied is open to debate. For example, are you creating generalizable knowledge when you ask a potential or future participant for input on the study design? Should you have some elements loosely designed, then obtain SR, SSIRB permissions, and only then make contact with anybody? I tend to fa fa favor the latter. Um, I believe the knowledge generation process starts at the point you are developing the research protocol. Therefore, as soon as you contact anyone, with the exception of a professional colleague, who is a member of the target study population, then you are creating generalizable knowledge, particularly with qualitative research. Now the researcher has a number of different roles that they can potentially uh, fall into and generally research texts will list them on, on, on this particular continuum and I think they come out of the old, old, old schools of qualitative research, ethnography, etc. 
<clears throat> First of all, you can be a complete participant. Um, the complete participant is someone who is either a part of an ongoing process and then takes on a research role. Say, for example, you may be a case manager in a community mental health center where you're also working as, while you are also working on your MSW. You find that when you get to your research class and your crusty meal research teacher makes you do a research project, you say to yourself, I ain't got time for all this. So then you strike up a brilliant idea. I'll study the lives of case managers. In such a scenario, if you were to ask for and obtain permission from the SSIRB and your menial research teacher to conduct a study in such a fashion that other members of the case management team and majors of the, members of the agency did not know that you were conducting the research, then you would be a complete participant. You'd be taking notes, getting data, but they wouldn't know it. In such a case, perhaps the only member of the agency who was aware that you were doing that you were also doing research would be the person who approved the study at the agency. <clears throat> One step further up the ladder of disclosure would be the, to adopt the role of participant as observer. In a situation such as this, you might be studying some social process, let's say a political movement. Say you find found it interesting the mechanisms by which it Tea Party movement recruited people who would seemingly have their best interests not served by the Tea Party. So you go to Tea Party rallies, participate in some of their phone banks, do everything they do, but let them know you were there as a researcher. The case would only be, this case, you would only be a participant as a, in this case, you would only be a participant as an observer role if you were already a supporter of the group. Now, the observer as participant, I know some of these terms get a little convoluted. The observer as participant role is exactly like the participant as observer, except the researcher makes no pretense of actually being a participant. So say, for example, you want to study the social interactions of individuals who volunteer in soup kitchens. Maybe because of your situation, you know you're never going to be able to be a volunteer. So you let everybody know that you're only there doing a research project and that you'll help out wherever you can, but you're not committing yourself to being a volunteer. Now, the complete observer. Uh, <clears throat> uh, when you're a complete uh, observer, you might simply observe without informing anyone that you're uh, a researcher or helping out in any manner. In the previous example of the soup kitchen, say you put on your oldest and dirtiest clothing, then sleep in it for several days, under a bridge of course, <clears throat> and then you can go down to the soup kitchen, get your soup and sandwich and observe the interactions of the volunteers. And remember, any rule where you adopt surreptitious observation modes will meet with greater scrutiny from the Institutional Review Board. Therefore, when you feel like you need that level of deception from revealing your research status, you will have to make a good argument to the IRB for such an exemption. <clears throat> the challenge of a good qualitative research is very similar to the challenge of a good social worker, particularly when working with individuals from a population whose culture norms or life circumstances differ dramatically from yours or the norm. Here we see two terms which are borrowed from ethnographic research lingo being presented as part of our social work research vernacular. The emic perspective, in my opinion, should simply be called insider perspective and the edit perspective similarly should simply be called the outsider perspective, but that would be too easy, particularly when it comes to taking test times, I guess. Both of these perspectives need to be articulated when conducting a research. Where do you stand? Both of these methods also take work to accomplish. I tend to favor the purposeful adoption of the emic perspective myself. I do this because, most importantly, you're trying to understand their worldview, not your own. 
By adopting the insider approach, I believe you will force yourself to go deeper into their lived experience. So for example, when you are observing a phenomenon, or perhaps when you're analyzing uh, transcripts or notes, you may think to yourself, I don't think I would have acted that way or thought like that way. When you find yourself thinking like that, you know you're being a good critical thinker and a good qualitative researcher. Because the next question you can ask yourself <clears throat> is, I wonder what made them act that way or think that way. This gives you a good question to take back to your research subjects and go deeper into their worldview. Because when you question why they did something and when you question some, when you question why they did something, you did that questioning from your own worldview. <clears throat> so that means you need to get into their worldview. Of course, there are times when the ethic perspective is most appropriate. People within groups are often socialized to believe certain cause and effect phenomenon that simply might not be the case. By its very nature, qualitative interviewing is substantially different from quantitative interviewing or surveys. Ruben and Babe suggest three common ways of approaching the qualitative interview, which is, by my experience, common across all research texts. All three are appropriate. Much of the importance of the difference being on how applicable they are to your research population and how your, <clears throat> and how your research question and design is set up. So there's no right, wrong, better, or worse in, in any of these. The informal conversational interview, I think, is a good approach to take, provided you have taken the time to edu educate yourself fully on both the topic and the population under study. Also, it is important that you be very comfortable with both the context and with the whole issue of ambiguity. Think of a conversational interview approach being similar to something like, oh, asking someone for a date or a favor, <laughs> or going out on a date with somebody you don't know. Blind date, there you go. You just don't know how it's going to go. <laughs> you don't know what their inclination is, etc. So the more comfortable you are with your knowledge of the topic and the objectives of the research, the more able you'll be able to handle that informal conversational interview. Sometimes you have a subject population that is more amenable to a more informal population. Let's take, for example, small children. Or really anyone else who has a tend to go off, tendency to go off on tangents in their thoughts. Since children are very concrete in their thinking, when they get on to one topic, sometimes it's hard to get them off of that and onto the topic of your interest. Therefore, a rigidly structured interview might be difficult for them, as they may want to stay on one subject matter for question one when you are wanting to move on to the rest of the questions. An informal approach or a semi-formal approach would allow for more ability in the interviewer to hear out the attitudes of the small child and then find a way to transition to the new topic. When you're doing qualitative research, particularly on complex topics with individuals who are capable of engaging in abstract thought on the fly, you might consider the, the general interview guide approach. Rather than having a series of open-ended questions that you might ask your respondents, you may have several topics or even scenarios that you present to them to get their brainwaves moving. Oftentimes when doing this type of interview protocol, one can seamlessly transition from one topical area to the other, particularly if you've done your homework well. And if you know the framework of the topic, with a series of probes or a series of silences on the interviewer's part, one might be able to complete the entire interview with very little structure, yet have the security of a guide to which we can make sure that each area of interest was covered. For example, when I conducted my study of the Native American church, I used a general interview guide approach. I had a list of, several, of about seven topical areas <clears throat> as uh, areas that I was curious about, and I would simply check off or make notes in the appropriate area as the interview progressed. Only on a rare occasion did I have to purposely bring up a subject to get my respondent onto a, onto a new topic or onto uh, or to complete all my my areas of interest. Yet more on <clears throat> qualitative interviewing. So how do you choose 
which are the two non-standardized interview techniques to use. Let's take a look back at the example of studying the lives of case managers when you yourself are participating in that role, either because it is your job or because you were assigned there as a practicum. Regardless of which observer stance you take, say that they are fully aware that you are studying case management because they know you are in an MSW program and are in a research class, and you have fully informed them of your intent to study them. And that becomes very amenable to do some reflective conversations on the fly. For example, you've gone to a client's home to assess their mental health status because there had been a report of bizarre behavior about your, your client or their client. As you watch your coworker conduct a mental status interview and come to a decision that the person is not a danger to themselves nor anyone else, you might take it as an opportunity, perhaps over a cup of coffee after the encounter, to pick their brain about their thought processes, their personal emotional experience of themselves, etc. Easily you can see that a standardized or even a general interview guide would not do in this type of research. Furthermore, there's absolutely nothing wrong with using both approaches. Staying with the study of the case managers, you could develop your general interview guide or even a more structured form of data gathering, either a standardized qualitative interview or even quantitative surveys that you could utilize in addition to your non-standard or informal approach. In fact, if you are studying a phenomenon that will be that you will be engaged in over a period of time, and many of you are at your practicums, then it might be a good idea to include that in, to, in your research protocol. The ability of doing informal con conversational interviews as the need and opportunity arises. This sort of approach <clears throat> has been used for decades or even centuries by naturalistic researchers. So it's a time-honored technique. Now the standardized um, open interview um, I, I, you know, I'm not a fan of it, so, uh, but it's appropriate. There are times when it's uh, entirely appropriate, and it does have certain advantages, particularly when it comes to time to analyze the data. It is nice when doing an analysis to have topical sections located in the same place. For example, you are studying a population that uses a lot of non-standard English, or perhaps they are hard to understand because of being mentally ill, or aged, or they're ill, or small children or something. For some reason they don't speak no good English, kind of like me. <clears throat> in such a case, you may do a standardized interview because it is brief, to the point, and because it also would be very difficult to transcribe into, since it would be difficult to transcribe into written form, you may do your qualitative analysis encoding by listening or watching the original recording. Since the coding of qualitative data in such a manner would be very time consuming, you would want to know that certain topical areas would either be at the, let's say, beginning, the middle, or the end of each interview, therefore facilitating your coding and analysis process. Sometimes some researchers talk about replicability and having each, um, each uh, interview the same. Um, uh, since we generally don't do probability uh, sampling with with um, qualitative interviews, I don't really think that's uh, an entirely valid argument. But people make it, nonetheless. Focus groups. Whoa, what's this? Get out of there. Uh, <clears throat> so focus groups are, uh, um, there it comes back again. It reads, the focus group hated it, so he showed it to an out-of-focus group, which would be, <clears> oh, <throat> uh, most of my class classes about halfway through my lecture. They, they start to go out of focus. Anyway, teasing folks. Um, <clears throat> Recall earlier in Chapter 17 where I differentiated a group as a unit of study versus a focus group. I said that a group that you as the researcher pulled together for the purpose of research would be a focus group. That actually could be not true in some circumstances. For example, say you assign people to a group to test a new intervention. Then that group would, 
would be would not be a focus group. And as I said, the converse. If the group naturally existed, then it would be a unit of study, not a focus group. However, one could utilize a naturally existing group as a focus group, provided they had the right expertise for your project. And focus groups can be like individual interviews. They can be highly structured, like a standardized interview, or to the extreme, completely unstructured, such as an informal converse, conversational interview. Of course, when I say unstructured, um, I'm not talking about anarchy or chaos. You have to remember that you have your role as a facilitator, and that will always be paramount. Focus groups can be very useful in that they oftentimes are able to generate a lot of information about a topic quite quickly. Now, focus groups have some advantages. Because you're bringing together a number of people at one time, focus groups quite naturally have a time economy to them. <clears throat> when you have a limited amount of time to bring together information, then think of, your fo think of focus groups as your solution. Similarly, they can generate results rather quickly because to some extent, some of the analysis or clarification can be handled by the group. Groups of like people often have their shorthand way of saying things that are idiosyncratic to their experience. And you, potentially an outsider, may find yourself occasionally lost because they're using terms with each other that are unfamiliar to you. That gives you the opportunity to have them clarify and explain uh, a process uh, or phenomenon in <clears throat> that you would have had to figure out yourself during your analysis phase uh, in a if you were using a different kind of data collection mode. Also, focus groups create the opportunity for a flexible and dynamic knowledge generation process. In focus groups, <clears throat> not only can not only you as a researcher can ask questions or make probes, but members of the focus groups can sometimes do that themselves. Also, members of the focus groups can express themselves in ways that is not appropriate for the researcher. For example, uh, you, you as a researcher would never make a judgmental or harsh criticism uh, of what someone had said. Uh, furthermore, you could never take on the role of, or you should never take on the role of a corrective authority with them. These are all things that members of the of a focus group might do, which might bring some problems. <clears throat> and focus groups do have there is a dark side to focus groups. So, um, by its very nature, <clears throat> a focus group will limit itself to those participants who are willing to share on a topic within a group context, often group of their peers. There are people who are shy by nature and would not do such a thing, but there are also people who may hold a radically different view of the topic and not want to subject, subject themselves to public ridicule. For this reason, focus groups are questionable in their represent, represent, representativeness. Furthermore, you as the group facilitator have the responsibility to conduct the group and control the group dynamics that enable individuals to feel safe in conveying their true beliefs. When you're working in some small populations, it might be helpful as well to know who and perhaps who should not be together in a focus group. As an extreme example, would, an extreme example would be if you were studying uh, gang behavior, you might not want to pull together members of, rank, of rival gangs into a focus group. But you don't necessarily have to be working with a dangerous group to be cautious of, about who you stick together. Members of, of social circles often know one another, and sometimes there's some history between individuals where your key informant and community guides will be invaluable. Switching subjects here. Different type of, of qualitative method. Um, uh, not method, qualitative technique is taking life, life histories, which is uh, you know, kind of a biographical approach to, to uh, a person's uh, life, you know, sometimes called oral history. Life histories can be good mechanisms by which to explore topics that may be difficult to uh, address it directly. Ruben and Bavi offer the example of the study of girls by Robin Robinson 
in which rather than her operationally defining sexual abuse, she relied on the description of life events from the girls. Girls offered and then, <clears throat> oh, that the girls offered. And then through skillful use of cues and prose was <clears throat> enabled to explore the topic of sexual abuse with them rather than on them or having having her definition of sexual abuse be the, the lead. Typically when using life history style of interviews, one would be using some sort of case study or case research approach. Now feminist methods can encompass quite a number of different tools of research. An important aspect that distinguishes feminist research is really the entire research process is viewed through the lens of a belief that a patriarchal and oppressive society has shaped the lives, histories, and well-beings of women, and I would say men as well, in this society. Methods that are used to empower women's voices in this research. Much of this empowerment happens during the report phase of the research, perhaps more so than the interviewing phase. <clears throat> Members of other oppressed groups can borrow feminist techniques to address issues related to racial oppression, cultural marginalization, really uh, anything similar to, to uh, you know, any institutionalized oppression or marginalization. Uh, feminist techniques, I think, can be very helpful. <coughs> it's important when you're out there in the world to um, record your observations some, using some sort of a technique. Um, and the two primary tools of the qualitative researcher is the field journal, which is often just a notebook in which one records specific uh, and sometimes predetermined things. Other times researchers will, will create field notes that list things like time and place of interview, foreshadowing questions that the researcher might have, etc. The researcher might take notes around which interview protocol was used at the encounter, if there's multiple, but they, they may also use the field notes to record things that are non-auditory, such as facial expressions, other non-verbal language, or make notes about the environment. Tape recorders are or more common these days. Some sort of a digital recording device have become standard in qualitative interviews. In the past, there was much discussion about the presence of this technology, which I think came from a time when the tape recorded, or, or I should say audio recorded, meant that you had to go to a certain place with a plug-in and sit beside this machine, often quite large, with large spools spinning around slowly, which quite naturally was a distraction to the interview. Even as smaller machines became available, cassette and microset cassette um, recorders, you know, they were still prone to problems. They would interfere with the research process. They made noise. Often their batteries would not last very long, which would, again, interfere with the research process. Now, modern digital recorders have silenced much of that criticism. For example, my digital audio recorder can run for days on two small batteries. Not that I've ever done an interview that's lasted days. Although sometimes I bet my class seems like it lasts that long. <clears throat> it's tiny. It's smaller than, a, you know, half a pack of cigarettes. Um, um, and it will literally record days on a memory chip worth of time at a very high, very high quality. So it's a great little thing. Uh, so I can ensure that I have fresh batteries installed at the beginning of each interview. I can either do that by putting in fresh batteries or by checking the little gauge that it has on it. Um, then I just turn it on um, and since it has a highly sensitive microphone, I can even place it at some distance from the interview. And that way it does not become the focus of the conversation. But this is not to say that I don't tell the interviewees that they are being interviewed, because I do. In fact, <clears throat> I have a standard practice of informing them that this conversation um, uh, of being interviewed, um, um, and I record that during the, um, during the um, 
consenting process. So the whole consenting procedure is also audio recorded. So, well, not the whole petition. I have them sign the consent first, then I have them verbally consent on the tape. So there's two different mechanisms by which they give consent. So they consent to participate in the research, then they consent again to participate in the research and to be recorded on the audio tape. So uh, I went ahead and included a uh, copy of the, um, let me see if I can make a, make a uh, mark here. No, can't. Um, the, where's my little button? Is that, oh, this is LibreOffice. This is the interview field note sheet that I used for my dissertation. It has several little little boxes here, a little place to put the date and time, the place, and the setting. Who the interviewer was, and you know, I didn't ever fill that out because it was always me. But who the participants were. You know, sometimes there was just one person, sometimes there were several. I put a little box in here to, that I put down anything that I'm feeling before you know, I even get there. Uh, and any foreshadowing problems, that doesn't mean like a problem problem, but what is the, what, what am I, what am I going to be asking about in this interview? What's, what's going to kind of be the topic? And then I've, I've got, uh, a spot down here where I can, can keep things kind of in order. The numbers are mainly for later coding purposes and they're not really to, to, you know, put certain questions with. And then over here on the side, I've got a separate place where I make observations of, you know, notes about the environment or nonverbals, that sort of thing. So, and this I would just, I would just use and then clip, you know, three hole punch and put it into a binder or actually ended up scanning it in and putting it in a PDF uh, form. So, so in taking notes, uh, they're in a field journal form like you just saw or following um, a catch-as-catch-can informal conversation, um, it is important to try and record both the, verb the verbatim of what people said. Of course, verbatim is best done with a digital recorder or some sort of an audio recorder. Um, but also record what you think about it at the time. Don't let, don't let it get mushy and let other things intrude try to get your immediate thoughts. It's not necessarily that you're going to stick with that immediate thought, but you want to know your, your, what you're thinking and feeling at the time. <clears throat> so record any emotional or other kind of sensory experience that you had during that interview or during that encounter. It is also important to not trust your memory any more than you have to. So make those memos and notes as soon as possible after the interview. You know, so if possible and, and, and if it is not intrusive, jot short notes on the margins of field journals or interview guides during the interview. And remember, nobody thinks twice about a newspaper reporting having their little memo pad making notes while they're interviewing. And the same is going to be true of the researcher. While a client being interviewed for the first time by a social worker in an agency setting may resent or feel dehumanized by the social worker paying more attention to, to the input at the computer than to them, the social worker research is in a different role than the social work practitioner in this case. So while there's a lot of overlap of social work uh, practice and research, there are some places where the two diverge. So, so that, oh, that's it for, I believe, for, for this um, session. I'll get on to the next one.